All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Palm Sunday. Uh, This morning, we are opening up to Matthew chapter 22, and we are in the final week of the life of Christ before his crucifixion and subsequent resurrection. So this is the season of Passover, as we're opening up to Matthew chapter 22 um, in the text, where all the Jews would come from everywhere as they were commanded to, to the city of David, to Jerusalem. And so the city and the surrounding region would be swelling to millions of people at this time, as we're opening up our text, to commemorate the Passover when God delivered them from Egypt, from the hand of Pharaoh, from their slavery, uh, from their torment, from their bondage, he delivered them and set them free. And the final plague that came upon the people of Egypt when, when the Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he was stubborn, he would not relent, he would not let them go, the final plague came upon the people. And they were told to put the blood of an unblem- unblemished lamb above their door and on their doorposts. And when they did that, the angel of death would pass over them. And so the Hebrew people did that, and they were passed over, and the angel of death came, and it did not touch them because of the blood that covered them. And so now they're they're commemorating this great celebration of God delivering them as they were covered by the blood of the Lamb. And so now we look back and we can celebrate at God's covering of us at great cost to himself that he indeed has covered us by his own blood, the blood of the son who came willingly and knowingly of the cost that was demanded to be paid. And he paid it willingly as he enters into Jerusalem for this last week of his earthly life that we're going to be studying for the next few months here because it is the last third of Matthew is the final week of the life of Christ, and it was kicked off uh, earlier in Matthew chapter 21 with the triumphant entry of what we call Palm Sunday. People were cutting off the palm branches, the branches of trees, taking off their cloaks, laying them on the road as Jesus came in, riding on the colt, the foal of a donkey, into the city. And people were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of God of the Lord, and he came in fulfillment of prophecy in the way that was prophesied in the time that was prophesied, and and people saw it and were excited, and the messianic expectations were soaring at this time. Hosanna to the son of David, they were crying, and Jesus enters, and he proceeds to cause a stir in the city. People are like, who is this person? Who's coming? And and, and he he comes into the temple, do you remember? And he overturns the tables of the money changers and those who were selling uh, pigeons for the sacrifice at that time. People who were turning a profit in the court of the Gentiles at the temple, the, the temple mount complex. And he said, this is to be a house of prayer for all nations. You've made it a den of robbers. They've filled it with greed and corruption. And Jesus drives them out, those who have profaned the house of the Lord. And then once these were driven out, Jesus proceeded to do what? He proceeded to heal the blind that were there, the lame that were there, the sick. People came to him, and he was healing them in this place. Because this was also the place for the blind and the lame to come to pray, to meet with God. And it became this this marketplace, this temple mount. So Jesus was doing these wonderful things, and the children around him were singing his praises. Hosanna! Hosanna to the son of David. And remember the chief priests and, and the Pharisees who, who heard what these children were, were, were singing praises to God, just like we saw this morning? These children singing praises to God. And they said, do you hear what these are saying about you? And what does Jesus say? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, You've prepared praise. He's like, have you guys not read this? This is being fulfilled about me. And then the next day, Jesus is hungry. Matthew 21 still, he's hungry. And and, and he's coming and he sees a fig tree. He's got leaves on it. And he searches it for fruit, but he finds no fruit on this fig tree. And then he curses it. And it immediately withers and dies. It didn't even have unripe fruit on it, which it should have if it was leafy. But instead, it it was a false tree. It was a false fig tree. It was a pretender. So so this is a a living parable that that he's demonstrating to to us, to his disciples. A tree that was pretending to be a fruit-bearing tree. 
but with no actual fruit. And then what does he do? He goes back into Jerusalem to confront those who were indeed pretenders. Pretenders, hypocrites, as he calls them, pretending to be fruit trees, fig trees and leaf, but they were those who had no fruit, those religious leaders. They, they knew how to have the outward appearance of being a fruit tree, uh, but they failed to produce any actual fruit. So Jesus is exposing them, these so-called religious leaders who were the PhDs at the time. They were the philosophers, the lawyers, the professors, and teachers of their day, the elites who, who rose to the top because of their intellectual prowess. And no one dared to question these guys. But here comes Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth from the sticks, from the backwater country, small town country boy who was a carpenter. And yet much, much more we know. Indeed, he is God incarnate, the king who has come, who has clothed himself in the garments of a commoner to put to test his so-called representatives. And he has found them wanting. So he comes to show the true way to life, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him, as he says. And this is what he is showing us, his disciples, the people. And each step of the way, he is confronted, he's challenged by these people who claim to represent God are coming against Jesus. And Jesus, as he says, these guys are actually serving the enemy. They're serving Satan, who is their father, who is the father of lies. Because they failed to recognize God in their midst. They failed to recognize Jesus. They failed to recognize the signs of the times. They failed the test. They failed, perhaps, and likely the first test in their life that they ever failed. It was actually the most important test. They failed to recognize the Messiah. And this is the test we're all faced with. How do we respond when we're confronted with the truth of God? So these men who studied their whole life to know this, who should have known better than anybody else, failed it when it was brought to their, to their very feet, right in front of them. They did not recognize him. And so, so Jesus tells parables. Last week, Craig talked about uh, a couple of parables, like the parable of the two sons. One son said, that he would do the thing asked of him. And then he didn't do it. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'll do it. And he doesn't do it. And, and then the other son said, I won't do that. And then he actually did it. So, so one passed the first test, but failed the second and most important test of actual obedience. And, and then the second failed the first test, but then, well, they actually passed the more important test, uh, the test of actual obedience. And Jesus said to the religious leaders, essentially, that you're the first son who said you do it, and then you didn't do it. You rejected John the Baptist when he came saying, the time is now, repent, the Lord is coming. They rejected John, while the tax collectors and the prostitutes received John's message of repentance. And they actually repented. Where before they're saying, no, we're not following the ways of God, and then all of a sudden, okay, we will. We repented, they got right with God where these religious leaders did not. So pretty incredible. Then Jesus tells another parable that we saw last week, if you're with us, about the tenants uh, who are caring for a vineyard that they did nothing to make. They didn't, you know, they didn't make the wine press. They didn't make the tower. They didn't plant the vineyard. They didn't you know, dig for the, the irrigation. They, they did nothing. They're just they're tending it. And when the landowner sends his servants to receive the fruit, what do they do? They beat them. They... they persecute them, they kill them, send them away, and the landowner sends his son, surely they'll honor my son. And they're like, here he is. If we kill him, we could take his inheritance. So they kill the son. They kill the son. And Jesus concludes at the end of chapter 21, saying to the people, but directing this to the chief priest and the Pharisees, saying, Jesus said to them, verse 42 of Matthew chapter 21, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. 
When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them, and although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. So the king has come. He is on the scene, and he's bringing judgment, and he is that rejected stone, that rejected stone that's become the cornerstone and has now become the immovable stone the rock of ages, that he calls us to build our lives upon, and then we too would become immovable in him. And now this brings us to Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. And this morning we're going to look at one more parable that Jesus tells in this sequence of parables where he's contrasting true and false faith. The heart that the king is looking for and the heart that the king is opposed to. He's looking for good fruit. And good fruit is found, as as we've seen, in obedience. It's found in a willing heart. It's found in a humble heart. It's found in the one who seeks to listen to their king, who is, in fact, more than a king. He, He is a king, indeed, yes, but he is nearer than a king, closer than a king. He is our bridegroom as he refers to himself, coming to claim us as his bride, the church, and preparing a feast and a celebration for those who belong to him, who belong to him. So not not only is he the all-powerful ruler and king, but he is the all-loving bridegroom seeking to pour out blessings upon his bride and those who draw near to him, who hearken to his voice in love and admiration and obedience and trust, to the voice of our bridegroom. So may we be those who receive the invitation of the king and respond with a readiness and an eagerness to celebrate the coming of the bridegroom. So let's dive in, Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse one. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. But they would not come. A king is throwing a wedding feast for his son, and those invited would not come. This is a, this is a spectacular event. The, the invitation to this event is a great honor, and those invited would not come come. What's going, why? What's going on here? The wedding feast of the royal son is being ignored. We saw a few years ago a a great wedding feast. We don't have royalty here, but you know, our friends in the UK do, you know, Megan and Harry's wedding a few years ago. I mean, the people who got invited to that were like, yeah, it's the biggest event. We're we're, we're canceling all our plans. We're going to be at this wedding. And yet Jesus here says, This is what the kingdom of heaven may be compared to. This is what it's like, a great feast, a great celebration. The royal son is being ignored. Do the people not understand? How can they ignore such an invitation? Don't they know what a great honor this is? And yet we see exactly the kind of people who are invited to come to this feast, but they refuse. We've been seeing them throughout Matthew's gospel account. The Pharisees, the scribes, the chief priests, the Sadducees, they were invited, but they would not come. John the Baptist was sent, but they rejected him, and they looked on with approval when he was taken prisoner and got his head cut off. Serves him right. He's a troublemaker. Got his head cut off for speaking the truth. Jesus, from his heavenly perspective, seeks to illustrate for us the reality of the kingdom of heaven. This is is what it's compared to. This is what it's like. If we could but grasp it just, just barely, we would see in reality the beauty of God, the beauty and wonder of God and the ugliness of sin and corruption that we find in this world. We've been deceived by a great deceiver, and God has come to pull back the curtain to reveal what, in fact, we are rejecting when we reject him. It is a great affront to align ourselves with the system of death, with the systems of the world. But our Lord is inviting us to life, 
to a great celebration, a great party. He goes on, verse 4, and again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Okay, first, I need to, I need to point out that this feast, the Lord is throwing, this party he's throwing, it's not vegan. <laughs> okay, it's not a vegan feast. All right, he's killing the fatted calves. There's going to be steaks on the table. There's going to be good meat there. Okay, that's important to some of us. Um, <laughs> The king desires people to come. This is a great feast. This is a great party. Everything's ready. It's prepared. This is the gospel. It's the good news. It's finished. Come and enjoy. The time is now. This is a good invitation to a celebration, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Come, all you who are weary, all you who are heavy laden. The feast is ready. Come. And see, find your rest. Verse 5, but they paid no attention and went off. One to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. So some were too busy with their own concerns. They paid no attention to the summons of the king. They saw it as, ah, I, can get, I can do that later. It's insignificant less important than, than their own ventures, their own business plans. And it was, this was a distraction to them. I got things to do. I got my nose to the grindstone. I, I got to produce. I got to be more efficient. I got big plans. So they ignored the call of the king to dine with him, to feast with him. While others, we see here, that, that were more perhaps slothful in nature and wicked of nature, they took the opportunity while the industrial people were off working we're busy. They then, these guys then seized the messengers of God, and they, they murdered them. They mistreated them. And remember, Jesus is telling this parable directly after, we just read at the end of Matthew 21, that these religious leaders, they plotted his destruction. They were plotting the destruction of Jesus. And here he is calling them out in their hypocrisy. And they hated him for it. They hated him in their hearts. So, so the king is calling us to eat with him. Are we too busy? We, we have to ask that question. We're confronted. Are we too busy? Do we dare ignore his summons you know, as we pursue our own little kingdoms on this earth? Or do we get mad you know, when, when, our, when our Netflix show gets interrupted? Like, oh, we got to do something. God's calling me to do that. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I don't have time. We're forced to ask this question in our lives. Do, do we tell God, just leave me alone, I'll get to it later? I don't want to hear about God, you know, I'm busy. Do we treat his summons lightly and of no accord? So we see in this, this parable and in real life that when the industrial people ignore God, the wicked prosper. And those wicked with nothing better to do take the messengers of God and they murder them. So I think for us, it is fair to understand this parable of Jesus as being both an illustration to the great wedding banquet at the end of the age, is what it's talking about, this great wedding banquet. It's finally ready, he comes, the bridegroom comes to receive his bride, the church. There's a great celebration. Clearly that is a, a meaning perhaps the first meaning of this parable, but also, this is also about everyday life, isn't it? And it challenges us to think, what are our priorities? What are our priorities in our lives? It's a daily invitation to dine with Jesus and to invite him into your home to dine with your family. And to daily look forward to that coming day when we will see him and be with him face to face. It's like every day, Lord, we invite you in to dine with us. We want to dine with you. We want to find our rest, our peace in you. And then we look forward to that coming day when we'll see him face to face. So, so a great test for us that Jesus puts forth in the Gospels. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So where are our treasures? It's not too hard to look. You look at your calendar. Where's your time, your talents, your treasures? 
what's taking, what takes priority with your time, what takes priority with your money. That's pretty simple. Jesus thinks it's a pretty good indicator of our heart. Uh, You refuse to give God your time and your money. Well, you're kidding yourself if you think you are the person in this parable who, who doesn't ignore the summons of God. If you can't even prioritize your time and your money around the things of God, then how are you going to do that when he summons you? <laughs> when he says, come. Well, everything is prioritized around this, this venture I've got going. <laughs> I, I, I've designed my whole life around this thing. I'm not going to give this up to answer God's call in my life. I put everything into this thing. Where, where do we find our time, talents, and treasures being spent? This is a test for us. We'll say to God when he summons us, he says, do you know, we'll say, God, do you know what it will cost me to set down my labor and to come to your feast? Do you know what this is gonna cost me? Do you know how much time and, and money this is gonna cost me to set this down and, and do what you call me to do? But when we say that to the messenger of God, who's saying, hey, God is calling you to come, and we say that to the messenger of God, it's not the messenger we're rejecting. It's God we're rejecting. It's God. He is the one who's extended us this gracious invitation to be a part of his kingdom, to belong to him. So he's calling us to set down our labor and come to the feast. This is what the kingdom of God is like. This is what it's like. It's a kingdom, and there is a king, and it's not us. Praise God for that. When he comes and tells us to party with him, we do it. Okay, God, I want to be part of what you're doing. I want to be part of your kingdom. I'm going to set down those things that I think define me or are going to define me. I'm going to follow you and your call. So consider, what, what is our treasure? What's our treasure? Where's your time? Meditate on that this week. Jesus goes on. He now tells us what the king of the universe does to those who murder his servants and ignore his invitation. <clears throat> Verse 7. The king was angry. <laughs> All right? They ignored the invitation and they killed the messengers. The king was a, I mean, Obviously, the king was angry. They murdered his servants. Or do we think God doesn't care that they cut off John the Baptist's head? <laughs> oh, he cares. He cares a lot. The king is angry. And he's angry because he's a good king. A good king cares about his servants. And he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers who burned their city. And, and, and burned their city. <clears throat> so see what's at stake. Rejecting the invitation of the king to the greatest feast imaginable is open rebellion. It's open rebellion. It's not honorable You know, these guys are not victims of a tyrant king. They are murderous rebels who have called evil good and good evil while murdering the servants of the king. This is detestable and punishable by death. This is what the kingdom of God can be compared to. The liar and the enemy of our souls will seek to tell us that the king is a tyrant. But this is the exact opposite of reality. For Jesus is in Jerusalem at this time while telling this parable, knowingly going to the cross. This was the mission for the sake of his citizens, the faithful citizens of the kingdom of heaven. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. The king who gave everything for his people, who will right every wrong, who will wipe away every tear. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Jesus continues this parable, verse 8. He says, then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. So it's an open invitation. It's been extended now to the people out and about on the streets. It's been extended to the Gentiles. Praise God for that. Most of us are Gentiles. We're totally unworthy of this invitation. And some of the people who they were seeking were seeking good. Some of the people were were steeped in immorality. 
Some are good, some are bad when they're called, but they're all invited in. This is the grace of God. While we were utterly undeserving, he brought us in. Verse 11. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen, concludes Jesus. So there was a man there at this wedding feast who was, who was walking to the tune of his own drum. He came to the banquet and he kind of made it about himself. He, kind of, he did. He made it about himself. You guys know the type who attends an event to honor another, uh, but in his conspicuous attire, he, he makes it about honoring himself. He is his own man. He will wear what he pleases and do as he pleases. And the king spots this person who was invited, who was called, but is not among the chosen. Because the chosen are, are willingly chosen, willingly obedient, and willingly dressed in the garments of the son. The garments to honor the son and to be in obedience to the royal son. And the, the father takes this imposter who has no love either for the king or for his well-beloved son, and he casts this imposter out to the places of outer darkness, the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, the place appointed for all rebels and pretenders and sycophants and those wolves in sheep's clothing. And this man was speechless, probably for the first time in his life. He was speechless. He had nothing to say when he's confronted by the king, and he was then cast out. Because he has said, by his, by his actions, he has said, I'm a free man and I do as I like. But this mentality is the mentality of one who is a slave of sin. One who has been too free with holy things and who has insulted the king. This is a man who remains unchanged by the gospel, still wearing the old stained garments, refusing to take them off, in essence, refusing to die to self, take up his cross and follow the king. So the king asks, where are your garments? The ones that were purchased for you by the blood of my son. Where, where are your garments? To cover your shame and your guilt. Where are your garments of repentance? Where are your garments of righteousness, of faith, and of truth? And this is how the parable ends. So all, all of these parables that Jesus is telling... They are not sedate, they are not benign, they're not passive, they're not safe. There is danger in rejecting the king. And there is joy in receiving him. Jesus is showing us a great contrast here, to taste and see that the Lord is good. And also, that to fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The heavenly perspective is one that invites us to imagine and see God in his transcendent goodness and glory and his invitation to participate, to come, to be fed, to be satisfied, to find rest. And then also the heavenly perspective reveals the terrible repercussions of rebellion against the king, refusing the invitation. For you're not choosing freedom, as our enemy would portray it, but you are choosing bondage and rebellion when you refuse the invitation of the king to come out of Egypt. <laughs> and this is a thing to be feared. This is the heavenly perspective. The world, the flesh, and the devil will tell us the opposite. Those three things are the enemies of our souls that we wage war against, that Jesus you know, tells parables to, to help us see in truth rather than to remain in darkness. Jesus is shedding light on the reality of our situation. He is lifting, in essence, the fog of war from our lives. The, the, the fog of war that, that clouds, we don't know the enemy's movements, he lifts it up. He said, this is what the enemy is doing. See in truth the situation you're in. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and you will find rest in him. You'll find true freedom in Christ, not the false freedom that actually keeps you in bondage seeks to drag you down 
so you would not receive the goodness from God, so that you would not be able to participate in the great wedding banquet at the end of the age. So, so the stakes are eternal. That's what Jesus is showing us. The stakes are eternal. And, and the truth of, of our Lord, it cuts through to the very heart of the issue. And we see in our hearts that, that often we love the lie. Our hearts find that the lie of the enemy is more convenient. And, and we believe in the lie to be free men, but that's, that's the lie, of course. Our freedom, our self-conceived freedom actually puts chains on ourselves. You know, we become trapped on Pleasure Island. And again, it's how we become slaves of Pharaoh. This is nothing new. This is how it's always been since Adam and Eve trusted and obeyed Satan rather than trusting and obeying God. And then there's been this battle, this war for our very souls where many are called but few are chosen. It's an open invitation. And yet some refuse to come. And some come but refuse to come to honor the king. They worship themselves and their identity over that of identifying with and loving our Lord Jesus, being found in him. So instead, they remain the kings of their own hearts. And when that happens, when you remain the king of your own heart, you are not wearing the garments of the king. And that person is cast out. So God doesn't force anybody to submit. We're not robots. He is a gentleman. He allows people to choose. And they receive the fruits of their choice. And they are shown to be chosen by their choice to not put on the garments of the sun. So as we wrap up, let's review the three things that have the potential to keep us from God's banquet. Number one, too busy. Too busy. Whew. That's a big one in our culture, isn't it? Too busy. There are lots of good things we can be busy with. There's lots of good things we can be distracted with while missing the most important thing. And that is a potential hang-up that we all face because we all have things in our lives here and now that we want to accomplish. And if we let it get a hold of us, we become too busy for the things of God when we prioritize that goal over the things of God. So what's the ultimate priority in our homes, in your home, in your life? Because hard work is good, yes, but there is a point where we need to set our work down to answer the call of God. Because our ambition can keep us in bondage. That's the warning. In the Fellowship of the Ring, uh, in the book, Gandalf says, uh, speaking about the minds of Moria. Gandalf says, the dwarves tell no tale, but even as Mithril was the foundation of their wealth, so also it was their destruction. They delved too greedily and too deep and disturbed that from which they fled Durin's bane. They awoke in the depths the Balrog, the great demon that ultimately destroyed their kingdom and force them to abandon the mines of Moria. They never rested from their toil. Their ambition drove them deeper and deeper. Their greed drove them deeper and deeper, and it awoke a demon that destroyed their home. Recently, I was uh, in the desert on our annual desert trip. Uh, thank you, Craig, for preaching for me. Uh, but we, in the desert, we like to explore mines. And we explored a certain mine um, in, in the desert, Modoc, Modoc mine. Uh, Tyler will correct me if I get that wrong. Um, and here it is. Uh, the entrance was collapsed a bit. Um, I haven't, you're not going to like this. <laughs> but it's a very cool mine. And it really opens up when you get inside. There is, there is, we found a way in right there. And you just kind of duck under this thing, and then it really opens up. Um, so we left a couple guys outside just in case it collapsed. So we went in, <laughs> and this thing was huge. It, I mean, they went deep into this mountain. And uh, you see this straight shot. This tunnel went str straight shot 2,000 feet back. And then it, it, you know, different things went left and right, and then up and down. 
you see down, it really made me think of the mines of Moria and the dwarves who delved too deep. Um, and we got to the end of the mine, and this was written on the wall. There's, there's some, some ladders. She's deep enough. We're done. She's deep enough. And there's people at, at the very end, people signed it, 1943, you see 1942, and that's when they abandoned it. They, they took their tools, and they went home. So there's a point where she's deep enough. That's it. You set your tools down. It's enough. You got enough. You dug enough. Now it's time to pack up and go home. Our work should be done with our head turned towards heaven. Listening and paying attention to God's call and his voice. Never letting our ambition get the better of us. Never let our, our striving after, after more and more, after, after more pleasures, after more stuff, after more things. We should never let that drive us to become deaf to the voice of God in our lives. Nothing you are working on is more important than the invitation of God to come and to dine with him. Nothing is more important than that. It's like when you're a kid, you're playing in the yard, and you hear that call for dinner. Mom's calling. It's dinner time. Okay, you know. You know from experience. You need to set down whatever you are doing and make your way inside promptly because you don't want to get there when the food that's been prepared with loving hands has grown cold. You want to set down what you're doing and get to the feast that's been prepared for you, lovingly prepared for you because it's a great offense to be late to that feast. The second thing that has a potential to keep us from God's banquet is when we refuse to listen to God's word. Uh, Paul warns Timothy of this in his second letter to him. He says in Timothy chapter four, verses one to five, he says, I charge you, Timothy is this young pastor, he's mentoring, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For, here it is, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Today, we see this to be true. People will gather to themselves, around themselves, uh, people to satisfy their itching ears. They can, they can curate a, a podcast list, a, a YouTube list, any, any kind of listening list they would like. The algorithms will help us with this to curate the list that will only satisfy your itching ears. People will gather themselves, these teachers. It's easier now than ever before to never challenge you, but only tell you what you want to hear. Never challenge us with the truths of God the sound teaching of his word. But only tell you what you want to hear. If you refuse correction, there are plenty of people, you could find plenty of authorities you could find to take your side, so to speak, um, and, and, and tell you what you want to hear. So our measuring stick must always be scripture. That, according to Jesus, that's our measuring stick. That was his. That's how he would challenge the authorities at that time, the Pharisees, the religious leaders at that time. He always said, well, have you not read? Have you never read? This is what God says. He teaches us to do the same. Uh, one sneaky way we've been lulled into false belief is through something that's been labeled moralistic therapeutic deism. It's this, this way of thinking that says, it's like a cultural kind of Christianity. It's a, it's a way of thinking that says, you know, God is, he's undemanding, he's, he's nice. He's cuddly. He simply wants people to feel good about themselves, to, you know, to do good, to do right things. And most people are good. He wants you to be happy, successful, you know, satisfied. You know, he wants you to feel good about yourself. There's no absolute moral truth. Uh, we see a lot of that. We hear a lot of that. And this is how, the, how, this is how people show up to the wedding banquet dressed in the wrong clothes. This is how that happens. They, they think, oh, I'm good. There's nothing I need to repent of. I don't need to change my garment. I don't need to change anything about me. And then you show up 
in your soiled garments. And then you're kicked out of the banquet. Which leads us to the last thing. Uh, When we come without being properly clothed, we can't be a part of the banquet. I actually had a dream about this four years ago during COVID. I had a dream. And, and I was at this banquet, and it was getting ready to go. It was being prepped. And uh, I, was, I was there, and I was so focused on this trash can. I was like, where does this trash can go? <laughs> it's the silliest thing. And I'm like so distracted by like these little things like in the room. And then all of a sudden, the banquet's about to start. And I'm not dressed. <laughs> I'm not ready. And you know that feeling that in the pit of your stomach that just drops? And you're like, oh. I didn't get ready. I didn't get ready. That's a terrible feeling. And I woke up, I was like, whoa. I think God's trying to tell me something. <laughs> right? So you get so distracted with like, like, like trying to do good things, trying to get ready, organize the banquet, get this stuff in place. There's a trash can. <laughs> it's like, I didn't get dressed. I didn't get dressed. That's, you get distracted with some good things and you forget the most important thing. Don't overlook that. How can we be clothed and ready? Isaiah 61.10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. Who has clothed us? He has clothed us with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Our Lord has provided us with the garments. By his blood, he gives us the garments of salvation. Again, Isaiah is written over 700 years before Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus, by his blood, adorns us with the garments of salvation. He has covered us with his righteousness, blotting out our sins putting upon us beautiful garments, adorning us with jewels as his bride, for we are his beloved. In Zechariah, he has a vision of Joshua the high priest, and he writes in Zechariah 3, 4, this is cool. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, remove the filthy garments from him, from Joshua. Again, he said to him, see, I have taken your iniquity from you and will clothe you with Festal robes. Festal robes. That's our our new garments. They're for the party. It's the festal robes where we get restored to what we what was lost. The glory of the garden. Of of seeing God face to face. We get adorned with new garments, festal garments that are beautiful. Revelation 3, 4, Jesus says, but you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So there's also this idea of of continuing to walk in it. We're clothed, continue to walk in it, continue to walk in it. Finally, Colossians 3, 12, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Sounds a lot like the fruits of the Spirit, doesn't it? I mean, these are the clothes that we are to wear as those who are invited by God to the greatest celebration of all time. These are our garments that we put, we put on. We put on. And the cool part is, we're not just invited to come, we're invited also to share. We're invited to be those messengers who are sent out to the very ends of the earth to go. The great commission of our Lord, he's like, participate with me. (laughs) Go be my hands and my feet. Go be my voice, teaching others what I have taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Behold, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Go and share this good news. The bridegroom is coming. He's coming again. Come be a part of it. Come be a part of it. We get to participate with our Lord in that. The book of Revelation, the, the final book of the Bible, and the final chapter of the, of the Bible, we read in Revelation twenty two seventeen, 17, the spirit and the bride say, we with the spirit say to the world, come. And let the one who hears say, come. As you have received, you now say, 
come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. For the price has been paid in full by our King. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you entered in, that you willingly came to Jerusalem to confront the darkness and then to pay the price that we deserved. You took it upon ourselves so that we could be covered by your blood, that our sins would be blotted out, that we would receive new, clean garments from you your imparted righteousness upon us, that we would come under you, Lord, that we would follow you, that we would deny ourselves, taking off those old garments and instead picking up the cross and following you. Lord, give us the courage, give us the faith, give us the the joy set before us to help us do so to your glory, Lord. May we keep our gaze and our ear bent towards heaven, listening to you, to your calling on our lives, to your invitation, and also extending that invitation to others. May we never get distracted by our ambitions here and now, that we don't hear you, that we don't follow you. Help us to listen, hear, and obey. Help us to walk in step, and help us to share the invitation. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together.